Hello everyone. A little humorous incident from the Reader's Digest. Our four-year-old daughter Marion had been a bit mischievous and I had tried, her dad, to correct her. I was sitting in the easy chair reading the paper. Her mother was sitting quietly on the sofa mending some clothes. So our daughter climbed onto the sofa very close to her mother and said, Mummy, do you think we married the right man? In the book of Genesis, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. You could feel alone even in marriage if husbands and wives feel disaffected with each other. Now, when God is sidelined, there is a temptation to concentrate overly on the physical and overlook the fact that physical intimacy in marriage is also a sign and pledge of spiritual communion. It's not something purely biological, as some people make out. Couples cooperate with God, we know, in bringing new life into the world. It's 50 years now since the landmark encyclical Humanae Vitae was promulgated by Pope Paul VI, soon to be canonised. But I believe it's also a sort of canonization of his teaching, which at the time in Humanae Vitae didn't go down very well, to put it mildly. But also, I believe, this was a kind of watershed moment of dissent within the Church and many other related issues. However, a lot of what Pope Paul foretold has actually come true. He said, for instance, the following in the encyclical. With the advent of artificial contraception, people should first consider how easy it will be for many to justify behaviour leading to marital infidelity or to a gradual weakening in discipline and morals. End of quote. Now, the Me Too movement, which we're hearing a lot about these days, is plenty evidence of this, and I would say only the tip of the iceberg. When Jesus welcomed children in today's Gospel, I'm sure he was encouraging married couples to accept children and not be like the apostles who tried to push them away and get rid of them. He was encouraging married couples to accept children lovingly from God and not see them as a burden or a hindrance to their freedom to do other things. We say animals reproduce, but humans procreate. Now, it's the design of the Creator that procreation should take place within the loving union of marriage. Now, if children are, and I put it in inverted commas, made by the clinical technicians in the laboratory, there is a danger that they may be seen as commodities and not as persons, whereas the Church always believe that from the moment of conception, there is a person there. Here, man is acting alone and not in tune with his creator. The scourge of divorce is fairly widespread, where husband and wife are struggling to become one in the gospel sense. Males and females are meant to complement each other, and in this way they reflect the image and likeness of God, but only in this context. Some would reduce the role of male and female to mere function, interchangeable at will. In this case, the male and female complementary natures ceases to be based on anthropology, but purely on function. In God's eternal plan for the human family, males and females are given different and distinct roles to play. Blurring that distinction only leads to confusion especially among the young. Jesus came to redeem marriage and to raise it to the dignity of a sacrament. The chaste love of husband and wife is intended to be a reflection, albeit dimly, of God's undiluted love for us. It's based on the Paschal mystery. According to St. John Paul, marriage in the Lord is the primordial sacrament it was there before all the others. It's mentioned today in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. 
So it's the primordial sacrament, the holiness of which leads to a couple's ultimate happiness and the stability of society at large. Thank you all for listening and God bless you all. Oh.